OBS says, are you sure you want to start streaming? That's a good question, OBS. I appreciate you. I appreciate you checking with me. <laughs> oh, man. What's up, folks? We're back with the, uh, with the live streaming from the drum room. My name is Steve Holmes. This is the obligatory, like, awkward, like, as soon as you hit stream, it's like someone's looking into the camera and, you know, there's technical issues and whatever. Um, but, yeah, we're going to do some drumming today. It's another drum room stream. We're going to do some drumming. We're going to talk about drumming. Uh, so leave those comments. And uh, the talking about drumming is, it's just as fun as the drumming itself. I mean, drumming is super fun. Um, but the talking about drumming is also super fun. So let's get those uh, questions happening. Um, I've got a ton of videos on my YouTube channel um, for folks that aren't familiar with that. So you can check that out and then watch one really quick and come back and ask questions. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we're just going to warm up and do some playing. And uh, let me know how it sounds. Uh, sometimes uh, the sound is crap or the, the video is crap and then I've got to stop and start over. Um, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, so that's it. We're going to do some playing. I'm going to shut up now. Thanks for hanging out. Again, my name is Steve Holmes, and we're going to do some drumming.
Man, this this Tom has got such a nasty, nasty ring. I, I gave it like a quick tuning pass before we started, and man, let's just hit it like with the vocal mic on so we can witness the ugliness of Steve's tuning. Ready? Ooh, we'll turn off the talking mic now. Yeah, I got to tune up that bottom head, actually. Woo! I was sitting there playing, and it sounded like someone uh, was, like, whistling or something. And I was like, what? What is that? Anyway, what's up, folks? My name is Steve Holmes. Welcome to the drum stream today. Streaming from Los Angeles. And uh, we play, we talk drums, you know, that kind of thing. Um, looks like we got a whopping two dozen folks here. Man, you said, you know, 24 people in a room, it's not nothing. So we're going to review the comments here and see what's going on. Pardon my, my breathing. I'm like totally out of shape here. Let's see. This is Luis from Mohawk. I know you don't know where this is. Ha ha. Could you talk about fast tempo and relaxation? That's actually a good question. Maybe we'll talk about that. Uh, Dave Beck, longtime fan, done this for. Can you please give a quick rundown? On your cymbal setup, sure. Uh, let's do that. Let's do that for Dave. He's been waiting. He's been waiting patiently. Um, geez, the cymbal setup. Uh, I, uh, I I'm a Zildjian uh, Zildjian artist. I love Zildjian cymbals. And um, what do we got here? The hats are a. Um, the top hat is actually a 13-inch New Beat from the 80s. This thing is ancient, and I love it. It's the oldest thing I got, and this is like. This is one of those symbols that's just, um, you know, the sentimental value is like priceless. And I actually chose 13 inch new beats because that's what was on the Neil Peart poster. <laughs> and I still think it sounds great actually for, for a lot of different styles. Oh, sorry, the bottom, oh man, I'm bashing up the mics here. The bottom is like a newer, uh, it's a 13 inch custom special dry is the, is the bottom. All right. So kind of a new school bottom with the old school top. That's what I was going for. And I tried like a new school top too, like, and I just, I just, and always end up coming back to the, uh, to the old newbie. Uh, this thing is a 15 inch uh, Azuka with sizzles, um, which I've talked about like every stream. Um, I like the Azuka because it has kind of the benefits of the China symbol, but it's not as kind of like abrasive as a China symbol can be. Uh, the main crash is a 16 custom special, sorry, it's a K custom session crash. 16 inch K custom session crash. Uh, I've got a bunch of splashes and I rotate. Now, did you see this thing kept moving? <laughs> uh, this is a Oriental sound effects. Um, it's an 11 inch, 11 inch Oriental uh, splash. This is the best ride ever. I love this ride. This is a 20 inch custom dry light ride symbol. Love this ride. Um, this was a gift from one of my best friends, actually, uh, Sammy J. Watson, uh, which some of you guys might know. Sammy J. is an amazing drummer. Um, he played with the band with the Apex Theory back in the day. Um, and him and I went to music school together, actually, and we're kind of we're kind of bros. And we would go to Guitar Center on Saturdays and just you know wank and mess with the drums and 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 have fun, like, you know, this is like in the 90s. And, you know, there'd always be like symbols in there that's, oh, this one's great, and, and, and I loved the symbol. And he just bought it for me one day. He was like, here. And I was like, oh man, amazing. Um, so this crash over here, this is a small 15 inch A custom. Uh, it's got a couple of holes in it actually, but there's nothing in the holes. And I like this crash because it, it works great in this room. This is a very small room. And it gives me a big crash and just gets out of the way. But any, any room that's like bigger than this and uh, that small of a crash probably won't give me what I need. Um, there's another another symbol back here that I'll bring out front. This is kind of an, like another China substitute. This is a 16-inch custom special dry crash. 
All right, I love this thing because this also kind of sounds like a china, but it's not as abrasive, doesn't get in the way, doesn't have that kind of like, ooh, thing that some china symbols have. So custom special dry crash 16 coupled with the 15 Azuka, and it's like these two things together. Uh, great. So that's the, that's the symbol setup. Oh, the stack here, real quick. Uh, folks are definitely gonna ask about the stack. Uh, this is, um, I'm always experimenting with different stacks and, and this is kind of like the you know flavor of the month. I'll, I'll be changing this uh, at some point, but just to show you what it is, this is an eight inch A custom splash uh, that is, it's in good condition. It doesn't have any cracks or anything. On top of a 10 inch trash former that is cracked. Uh, I really like the trash formers. I got, I've got a bunch of these actually. Um, but yeah, this is the this is the stack of the of the month. I had one. I had a different one last year, but um, this one is a little. Um, it's a little louder. It's a little more like percussive. It's got a bigger impact to it. Um, so eight inch a custom splash on top of a ten inch trash former. That's cracked. So everything Zildjian. Love my Zildjians. Uh, period. The end. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Hail Bianco, lovely touch. Thank you very much. Double base, 1985 <laughs> says, uh, I have a hard time keeping my left foot in time when I'm playing, and I've been playing for 20 years. Um, well, it's interesting because when someone says, like, oh, I, I can't do this, you know, I can't make a good lasagna, but I've been cooking for 20 years. Like, okay, well, how much time have you spent like on lasagna, really, is the question. Um, so it doesn't matter how long you've been playing. It matters how long you've been practicing the thing that, that you're talking about. Uh, in this case, we're talking about uh, tapping your left foot and keeping time while you play, which we've talked about before in other streams. But I mean, wow, this lug is completely loose. Um, I like sloshing the hat on the quarter note uh, when I'm improvising uh, because, I mean, it it's a good, I mean, it conveys the time of what you're doing. Uh, I mean, I just think, it, I just think it's kind of cool <laughs> from a drumming perspective. I mean, for years and years, I'd see guys play and, and, and kind of play open solos and, and that like, that hi-hat would always go. And it's not necessarily a chick, it's, it's what I call like a splash, you know? Um, and I just think it sounds cool, but you want to, be able to do both, like chick it. Oops. Sorry. Wow. Let's do this. Let's let's do the hi hat things. Um, chick, like like closing it tight. Chick chick, and like splashing it. But that was a good splash. You know. And so if if you want to get good at at keeping that going, man, then just pay attention to it, and when when it stops or when, you know, the independence is, is struggling, when your body's like, whoa, I can't, you know, I can't kind of keep this going while I'm playing certain things, you gotta stop, you know, and work on that and slow it way down. And, and you gotta think of, you gotta think of your left foot on the hi-hat as part of like every lick that you know. <laughs> you know, like if it's like foot right left, foot right left, you know, then, you know. <laughs> And you gotta add, like, well, what's the left foot doing? Is it on the downbeat? Is it with the bass drum? Then that's part of it. You, know? you just gotta re-examine all your stuff and ask yourself, well, where where is the corner note in this? And and let me get the the hi hat going. And if you're having trouble with that, chances are it's an independence thing. And you just gotta slow it down. Um, and when you when you're struggling with independence, and when I say independence, I mean like the limbs are independent from each other. You know, and they're not. They're not uh, controlling one another because sometimes if you try to do something with your right hand, you know, your left foot or your left hand will go with it at the same time because that's just the natural instinct that everyone is born with, and you got to break those apart through practicing. You know, um, I would suggest uh, examining the different subdivisions, you know, and and uh, just tap your foot and just play them like hand to hand, you know, and uh, when you're in, when you're singing phrases to yourself, like I'm constantly drumming in my head, I'm constantly singing, drumming, like it all has to happen in here before it can even happen here, right? And so you gotta make that that quarter note part of your internal drumming, 
you know, your internal music. So if you're singing, you know, a drum phrase, you know, I'm always, I'm like, like I can hear that quarter note, I feel that quarter note, and so I almost want to, you know. You know? Um, so just start, you know, start with basics and, and, and again, like, isolate the things that you're having trouble uh, keeping your foot going, you know. Um, play a groove on the ride cymbal, keep this foot going, and when, when you play a fill, like, pay attention, like, is my foot stopping? Chances are it is, you know. You don't want your left foot to stop, you know, during the fill, you know, because it communicates time, you know, and if you're playing quiet and, and you can still hear this, there's, like, there's tons of benefits to doing that. You know, other musicians that you're playing with, because if you're playing the kind of phrasing that's hard to feel, <laughs> you know, for better or for worse, you know, it's good to communicate to the audience, it's good to communicate to musicians that, hey, man, I'm on the grid, this is this is the quarter note, you know. Um, it's almost too automatic pilot for me. Um, so let me just play some basic stuff and, and see what happens with the foot. So just messing around trying to keep it basic at first and then doing some improvising like just on the drums with no cymbals, playing a groove like on the ride cymbal, etc. Um, just got to do it slow, you just got to practice it just like anything else. All right. So how's that for left foot hi-hat, ooh did you see that, my snare drum totally just went down right now, oh man. Right, did this thing break? The snare drum doesn't want to come up anymore, you guys. I think maybe it broke. All right. Let's uh, talk about another question while we're messing with the snare stand. Um, more blush to... Ha <laughs> Right. Third two into the Tour de Force live. Uh, Egyptian to Steve Gadd starts playing one of those iconic licks. I'm sure you know it. Could you break it? I, I would have to listen to it again. Um, maybe I'll listen to it and... Uh, We'll talk about it on the next stream. Chances are with Steve Gadd, it's like it's like one of three things or one of four things, because that's what he that's what he does, right? He has uh, he came up with a few things that are like game changer licks. There we go. Um, that everybody copied and kind of uh, kind of became drumming scripture, if you will. Uh, there's a new Gadd book called Gadaments. Uh, if, if folks aren't hip to, to the Gad book and you like Steve Gad, you should uh, you should check it out. Oh man, now my mic <laughs> my mic is all like the snare's all higher too, right? Because I, t I was like tuning it up. Let's raise this up a little bit more. Steve, can you talk about snare height, please? Uh, no. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, did that song go, oh, oh, Dig the Song Go Feel, can you, you hear a Weckle and Bissonette? You know, it's funny because those are the, <laughs> like, yeah, obviously, I mean, Weckle kind of, you know, he, he's, he's Mr. Songo. He put the Songo on the map. And I hear the Songo, like, too much. I want to go to it too much. And while I was playing it today, I was like, man, this is just stupid and I should stop. Um, but I decided to, like, oh, what the heck, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to do it. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. I, I, I suck at Latin drumming, uh, including the Sango, but I was just having fun with it. It's like contemporary 90s wannabe Sango. Um, hey Steve, sounds great. Yeah, thank you, amazing. Um, let's see. 
da 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 a couple of these are like da 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 da. wow a lot of comments here this is nice the talking is like just as fun as the drumming um did that song go derek what's up steve excited to do lessons with you yeah i'm i'm booking some lessons with some folks on weekends uh, with this uh, setup here. So if you think this sounds good enough and you want to do like one-on-one -on -one lessons over Zoom or something, drop me an email, uh, steveholmes at gmail.com. Also, if you want to support the YouTube channel, you can support right now. There's the little smiley face button with the little dollar sign button. Um, uh, folks are able to, to make a contribution to the channel through that. Uh, we're saving up for some new hardware uh, for the cameras. Uh, we want to get more than one camera going here, uh, but I have to buy like a camera switch and actually a new, a new laptop because we're using a really old MacBook Air right now. And every time I go back and watch these streams, like it's super choppy and stuttery. Like, I don't know how you guys put up with it. Um, but yeah, anyone wants to contribute, um, that would be much appreciated. Uh, let's see, sounds great, thank you, amazing. Let's see, oh, some of these comments are like, um, oh, let's see, let's see. you always use the 13 in chat symbols? Yes, I've used 13s uh, like forever. Uh, man, I need to start learning to keep my time with my left foot. Yeah, we just we just we're talking about that a bunch. Uh, it's amazing how much I bought from posters and MT ads. Never sound as good as their stuff. Um, that's funny. Nice recording customs in the background. Yes, we should set those up at some point. Those are like the '80s mint recording customs. Eight, ten, twelve. Jeez, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen. Actually, with a twenty-two. Um, who knows? Maybe one day we'll see. I've always wanted to do like a draw, like a proper, like properly edited like YouTube video with kind of a, uh, and play a piece that's like, you know, uh, designed for two drum sets and, and do both parts, but one on the Phoenix kit, which is this, and then one on the recording custom. I think that would be cool. Um, as stuff is just so time consuming. Uh, what did you learn in your private lessons with Dave Weckl says THX? Um, geez, you know, Weck is, Weck is super forthcoming, obviously. Like, he has so much educational stuff. And, I mean, I hate to say it, but most of the stuff we talked about is just the same stuff that he talks about in his lessons. He was just kind of, like, you know, more specific to me in terms of, like, well, you need to do more of this or, or less of that. Um, and I took a few lessons with him over the years. And, uh, you know, as, as the years went on, you know, I kind of, you know, I, I, I was kind of improving. And so there was kind of less and less stuff. Um, not to say that there's there's always room for improvement, obviously, but but I remember the last lesson I just kind of like oh I just want to kind of hang out and and have fun and and you know I played him like some CDs of some stuff I had done and we just talked about about like you know time and locking in and and that kind of thing and I remember uh, when I played him like one of the CDs um, he did the thing that that not everyone does you know like if you play music for someone and then you put it on and they listen for like five seconds and they're like, oh, I like this, or man, that, you know, they start talking about it. And inside you're kind of like, just listen. <laughs> and Weck didn't talk at all. Like he, he like, he, he just like listened, you know, like that, <laughs> like he dug into it. It, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, but when I took my first lesson with him, like 93, man, that was a huge deal for me, obviously. Cause you know, uh, I had just moved to LA and I was going to Musicians Institute. And this is before the internet, before cell phones, all that stuff, obviously. Um, and I was just, I was just straight up stalking him. Like I would, he was playing all over town, and I would just go to see him all the time. And you know, after a while, it's like, oh, hey man, how's it going? You know, like he, he would recognize me, and then I'd just tell him, like, oh man, I want to take a lesson, blah blah blah. And uh, he was a guest teacher at Musicians Institute for our studio drums class uh, that normally Ralph Humphrey t taught. Again, this is 93, and Dave came in, and he recognized me again, and hey, what's up? And, and I guess Ralph mentioned something to him about me and, you know, being serious about drumming and stuff. And so Dave actually called me. So you got to, like, remember, this is in the 90s, like, on the landline with the curly cord, like a regular analog phone at my apartment. And, uh, and uh, I just remember, like, you know, trying to act cool on the phone. Yeah, Dave, cool. We'll do a lesson. And then, you know, we... I hung up and I just I just freaked out. Man. Um, anyway, he was getting into the Freddie thing right right around then, um, the Freddie Gruber thing, uh, which is you know Freddie Gruber is a is a um, a drummer that's no longer with us, uh, but he had spent a lot of time with Buddy Rich and 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 he he knew a lot about um, you know drumming technique and that kind of thing and and I don't know he's kind of like it's kind of like the 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 
you know, the wise, you know, the, the wise elder of the drumming community, you know, when he was around. And so, you know, a lot of guys were taking lessons with him, Steve Smith and, and, and Weckl and stuff. Um, and so Dave was just getting into the Freddie thing. And the benefit of that was like Dave was just hitting really hard and kind of burying the stick into the drum and not letting the stick bounce back like it wants to do. Uh, and, you know, you may have heard him talk about that a million times, but he was kind of, he was getting that onto me at that point because he was, he was on fire for that concept, you know, having just kind of been exposed to it and really wanting to like, you know, get that into his playing. And uh, that's when I was exposed to it. And, and I kind of do that a little bit. Like I spent some time working on that over the years. Um, but I think that it's, I mean, it's not, I mean, if you watch, if you watch him or anyone play that, that preaches that bouncy thing, like they're not doing it <laughs> all the time. They're not doing it. I mean, I want to say they're not doing it a lot. I mean, because, because in order to, for the stick to cut, like bounce back, like that takes time. And in between stroke one and stroke two, you will only have X amount of time. And so sometimes that's not enough time uh, for the bounce to happen. And so the faster you play, the less time there is uh, for the bounce to happen. Um, but for those that are curious what I'm talking about, it's basically like with the right hand, you know, the fulcrum, you know, the, the, the actual point where I'm like holding the stick is like, it's not with the index finger, you know, some of the time. Um, it's with the middle finger, and so what that does is when you hit the drum, you allow the stick to bounce back like that because it does want to, you know, so it's like kind of, you know, using physics to your advantage. All right, so if you hold with the middle finger and you hit the drum and you kind of hold loose enough to allow the stick to bounce back, it does, which is, I think is pretty cool. But if you do it with the, with the, with the index finger, it's, 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 uh, it's not as possible because you have to squeeze hard to not like drop the stick. You know, I mean, I guess you can, but um, yeah. So, so that was that. That's like, like paint everything with that color, like that to everything. It's like, you know, and he would say like, oh, you know, pull the sound out of the drums. Don't, you know, don't, you know, hit hard enough to like, uh, to kind of bury your stick and kind of. It was more of a let it breathe, let it come out, let it bounce thing. Uh, and Weckl's got an online school actually right now. It's like, I don't know the address. It shouldn't be hard to find if you Google it, like Dave Weckl online school, you'll find it. Uh, and it's worth definitely checking that stuff out. He has like, um, he's got a lot of recent videos. It's not like, oh, just a bunch of the old stuff. It's like, no, this stuff was all filmed very recently. He goes, he goes over literally everything. And so at the very least, like subscribing to that for a month and just checking everything out uh, and then canceling whenever you want. Um, definitely worth definitely worth checking out. He's the king of that stuff, you guys. So you know you should you should check that stuff out instead of listening to me kind of regurgitate the diet version of his thing. Um, let's see, let's see. Sticks are big symbol. Tried to sell you more symbols. <laughs> okay, uh, this also makes the best. Then I never spent time but playing with my left foot. Focus more on just double bass. Hence the name double bass. Hey guys, did you hear that? Double bass didn't focus on his left foot, he just focused on double bass. Double bass, you gotta use your left foot to play double bass, so I don't quite get that, but I hear you. Um, let's see, Latin would help with this too. I would think I've been starting to learn Latin beats. Man, there's so much resources out there, you guys. There's no excuse for not, for not like, you know, doing something if you're serious about doing it, you know? There, there's guys out there like Jimmy Branley, uh, Raul Pineda, you know, these guys are like, they're like LA cats now, but they're, they literally came from Cuba and, and, and they know that stuff. Like, like <laughs> they know it, they are that stuff. Like culturally they grew up with it. And there's a lot of footage of them, like as kids playing in Cuba, it's nuts. If you guys are into Latin drumming, you know, those are the two guys that I really like, um, that take it like to the drum set and do cool, like drum set stuff with it. Uh, Jimmy Branley, who actually just put out a new CD, like literally just put one out. Um, but I can't vouch for it. I haven't heard it. And then Raul Pineda. Let's see. Uh, the hi-hat is communicating eighth notes when you splash like that, which is even better. It depends. I mean, it depends on if it's quarter notes or eighth notes. I mean, uh, uh, and if I'm doing like half time or, or, or not, like, you know, it, it depends. But you, you want to be able to do both, I think, is the, is, the, is the key. Let's see. I have a problem getting the single stroke roll fast. Of course, it's my left hand. Yeah, single strokes are, you know, I don't know what to tell you. You know, I, 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 my singles are not very good, um, but I spend a lot of time playing like on my legs, playing on pillows, playing on surfaces that don't bounce, which is contrary to the thing we were just talking about, right? Um, that was the other thing is, uh, you know, versatility is important to me. And so I want to 
not rely on the bounce thing. I want to be able to power out the strokes if I want to, because there's 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 an energy and a power behind like kind of hitting hard that you can't get otherwise. You know, that was one of the the advantages I had to to being kind of a rock guy before I was like a jazz fusion, you know, nerd. You know, but I was all into you know progressive rock and and Rush and and Genesis and the stuff in the '80s, banging away on my drums, match grip as a kid for years before I got into like you know the traditional grip kind of jazzy thing, uh, and then when I would play my rock stuff as this new kind of traditional grip thing, it had kind of that hard hitting energy still that I still kind of have and I like really, uh, and that's from kind of, if you will, like graduating from the rock school, you know, getting into that stuff, following that stuff, playing along with that stuff for, for years and years, um, because I think that that energy is good, and not all guys have that stuff, you know, you can tell the guys that didn't do that, that they just did this, like, from the start, you know, they, they're kind of missing that balls, that kind of rock energy. Um, let's see, maybe tilt the wheel, you know, on the snare sting, let's see, you just dropped in to say I love you watching your vids, thank you, Anthony. Uh, let's see. Great book, just got it. Sun goes one of the only let me I can do. Hello from France. Really enjoyed the lockdown videos. Tim Wilson. Hello, sir. Um, let's see. Those are nice ones. Recording customs. Yes, to, Steve. Did you go through much of Gary Chester's new breed book at all? No, I never did that book actually. Um, and so I can't. I mean, that's probably not a good thing. So I shouldn't brag about that. But because a lot of people talk about the bo that book. Um, it's been very beneficial to tons of people, so that's definitely worth checking out. Apparently from an independent standpoint, it's like, it's crazy. Uh, Derek A says, do you have a practice pad routine? Um, someone just uh, donated, you guys. Who donated? Tom. Tom with the five bucks. Uh, can you talk about your left hand position going between ghost notes and backbeats? Uh, I can try. Thanks for the five dollars, Tom. Uh, anyone else that wants to donate, uh, hit that button. Hit the little smiley face of the dollar sign um, and contribute to the channel. Uh, Tom wants to talk about left hand position uh, between ghost notes and backbeat. Um, man, uh, I mean, I, I guess, and that's so automatic pilot, it'd be hard to, to kind of go into detail. I mean, I can say that, like, when I am playing a backbeat, uh, I, it is, it's, I, I, I try to do a rim shot like every time, you know, like hitting the rim and, and the drum at the same time. Um, and it's important to me that the ghost notes are super quiet and the backbeat is nice and loud. You know, um, that's important to me. But in terms of like my position, like uh, I, I guess I can say that, I mean, I want my arms to be uh, straight, you know, the lower part of the arm. I don't want it to be like, you know, like this uh, or, 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 you know, down below that, the halfway point. And it's interesting, someone asked about like, hey, what did Weck tell you in his lessons? That was actually one of the things that he said that stuck with me is it, is it, you know, you want to hit the drum at the at the 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 uh, climax of the stroke, right? Like the the uh, the um, the apex, <laughs> uh, which is like halfway down. You know, like you don't want to hit the drum like kind of here in the stroke because you know you haven't gone. You're kind of like interrupting. You know, and if you do it more than halfway, then then again, it's like it's not it's not at the peak point. And so that that made a lot of sense to me. And so in terms of, of position, like kind of like straight, you know. Um, and I mean, for folks that don't play traditional, I don't know how applicable, you know, this is. Um, let me just play a little bit and and try to mention things that I think are important. You know, and there's a lot of molar going on there, Tom. Uh, a lot of, you know, uh, doing a stroke and coming with the inner kind of molar strokes, you know, da 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 you know, a lot of molar going on there. Um, and I spent a lot of time uh, practicing the ghost note after the backbeat, right? So, because I always thought that sounded super cool. And and that took some some practice to get. But instead of like, boon, bat, it was like, boon, bada you know, which I, I just think is cool. And so um, I spent some time on that. Um, and just like, I mean, ghost notes, man, that's that's such a, a broad topic, but it's just suffice it to say that that whatever like the bass drum and the backbeat are doing, like I just 
kind of ghost everything else like within reason um and i kind of got that thing where you know you can play like the, the continuous 16th notes uh, without stopping that that's all molar uh, there's a little fingers in there uh, it, it's worth mentioning that that i think it's important to try to you know use a combination of all three engines if you will and by engines i mean like arm wrist fingers you know they all contribute in their own unique way and they all kind of work together to get the sound that you want to get but but you have to know uh you have to know what you're going for you know that's that's <laughs> that's such a, a big topic uh it's just like i said before like it's got to happen here before it happens here like like i could sing i could sing like what i would play before i play it you know that's what i mean um and so you know step one is not like oh you know the, the, it's not coming out like through hitting like it's it starts here and then comes out you know um so you gotta know what you want to play first um someone's asking about the molar technique man if you google that you'll you'll get the to you'll get the phone book um the molar technique just really quick it's like it's like you know uh hitting the drum and then getting a couple extra strokes as you bring your hand up right so you're like stroke 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 you know um or you can get like more than one extra stroke on that bring it up like one two three like right Sorry. Um, so that downstroke, I mean, the benefit of the molar is that it resets it. It allows you to do a bunch of strokes and then start over. And because, you know, more specifically, like the, the more strokes you play in succession, the less energy your hand has, your wrist has, the, the, the less time you can do it, right? Like you can only go so far without giving your hand a break. And the benefit of the molar is that it gives your hand a break without kind of interrupting it. So you're like da 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 you know, that kind of thing. And so Tom, to answer your question, like I'm doing that a lot, you know? Um, so I, I don't know, I think that, that kind of covers it, you know? Like be aware of the dynamics, like loud versus soft, you know? Play this stuff slow, like I like playing slow. I mean, I can play all my stuff super slow. Not everybody can do that. I remember watching instructional videos and they'd be like, you know, you know they'd play the thing at regular time and then like they they play the same clip like on slow speed and so it sounded like like and I'm like what like just like it's hard to play stuff slow you know it's hard to play fast things slow but the benefit of doing it is that it's kind of like it forces you to like look under the microscope and zoom out like zoom out the grid and see where the no notes are like boo de de boo da de right like that's important. Man, that's hard because, you know, when I play slow, like I want to start subdividing and playing fast again, right? And that's the temptation. Um, and I caught myself doing that at the end. I'm really sorry for the sound of my, my freaking, my 10-inch sounds so bad. <laughs> Boo! Um, anyways, yeah, playing slow, using arm, wrist, and fingers, being aware of the volume differences, having your arm straight, all of those things uh, contribute to the left hand uh, position. Um, and I don't know, looking at the drum, um, 
It's about eight o'clock. You know, the left stick is kind of protruding out at about eight o'clock, I would say. Um, maybe between seven and eight o'clock. You know, it's like a nice 45 degree angle, arm straight, you know, sitting up straight, you know, having that balance, you know, that, that, that uh, that you don't want to be anchored in the center. You don't want to be like leaning to one side because that's totally going to mess up your independence. Um, that kind of thing. You want to be like centered, balanced, be able to use like all four limbs without like being off balance. Like, whoa, you know? So I hope that helps, Tom. I appreciate the donation. Uh, let's see. Uh, sound as good as one you have. Do you have a practice pad routine? I don't. When I, I mean, not really. I mean, I've spent a lot of time on a practice pad, obviously. And I just play the same stuff that, you know, just whatever, double singles, paradiddle stuff, flams. Actually, I practiced a lot of flam stuff on practice pads when I was trying to, I was inspired by Virgil's flam phrasing, you know, playing flams like in succession, you know, blah, 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 that kind of thing. And I spent a lot of time on, on pads with that stuff. Uh, Steve, what's the style that you play with your band? Uh, well, I'm not sure what band we're talking about. Uh, I have a trio called Altered. Uh, that's just like instrumental music, you know. It's a, it's, it's like you know, instrumental jazz rock, you know. Uh, we've got, we put out three CDs in the '90s, and I think they're on streaming services. Uh, but actually, the bass player is this guy, amazing bass player John Flitcraft. He just started a, a channel on YouTube uh, to promote, like, giving lessons. John's amazing. Thanks, Steve, for this, uh, for the lesson. Let's see, awesome homes. Muller technique, yes, we talked about that. I usually hold my right stick with my index, so I need to go with my middle finger. If you if you want, uh, let's see, Steve, great content. Uh, we're, we're scrolling back up. Let's see. Da, da, da. Oh man, lots of lots of comments. This is good. Let's, let's see, great content you provide. Love your videos and approach. I wonder if you would do something on up-tempo jazz playing. Um, you know, uh, I'm not really, I'm not that good at up-tempo jazz playing, uh, you guys. And there's a couple of videos I've seen, like there's a, there's a guy, uh, Danny Gottlieb. I, have, I don't know how to spell his last name, I'm sorry. It's like Gottlieb or Gottlieb. Uh, it, it, you can find him on, you know, if you Google him. Uh, you know, he, he had some success a while ago playing like with Pat Metheny and stuff. And, and uh, he's a student of Joe Morello. Joe Morello from, you know, Dave Brubeck fame. Uh, living legend. Anyway, those guys are like, you know, um, they're all into technique and stuff. And Danny's got a great video on YouTube about up-tempo jazz playing. Um, I would check that out. Uh, when I play up-tempo jazz, I just play the same stuff I play at medium tempos. I just try to play it fast. <laughs> um, I try to make sure my ride cymbal is kind of like leading the charge in terms of dynamics. You know, because that's the, that's the timekeeper. That should be swinging. That's the priority for me. Uh, and anything else is like, you know, kind of like underneath and supporting that, you know, that's kind of my approach to that. But like from a technique standpoint, I mean, I'm actually having like, I've got like 10 in issues in my elbows and stuff now. So I, I, I don't want to spend too much time playing up-tempo jazz stuff. It's probably the worst thing I could do for them. Um, let's see. Uh, great content. Oh, yeah. Up-tempo jazz. Okay. We just talked about that. Uh, Steve Smith also has a great hand videos. Uh, yeah. Steve Smith. Um, yeah, he kind of went around the bend at one point. Like he, he kind of, you know, I don't know. For Steve, like I'm a, I, I've like graduated from the hardcore Steve Smith fan club, um, and uh, I've, I, I, uh, I don't know. Steve reached a point where it became, it became so much about technique that it almost, the focus, the focus was on it so much that it kind of turned me off after a while, you know. Um, but for a long time, I was a big fan of his. Um, also, I just got kind of to the point where there wasn't a whole lot of mystery to the stuff that Steve was playing. I kind of knew what he was doing. Um, but I mean, love, love, love his drumming and it definitely changed my life. Like those early DCI videos, like in the 80s, Steve Smith Part 1, Steve Smith Part 2, that stuff, oh my God. Those videos changed my life, like period at the end. Um, let's see, using the left foot. Double bass, 1985 being super chatty here. This is good. Using the left foot and I have to keep time just playing double bass. Oh, okay. Uh, it's different. Yes, I hear you. Uh, let's see, Jerome Nichols, you are an awesome instructor. Thank you very much. Frisco, Frisco Pisco. <laughs> hey, Steve, what do you think about the late Carlos Vega? 
Um, man, uh, I mean, I love Carlos's drumming, you know? Uh, really, I, 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 when I think about guys like Carlos and, and Jeff and those guys, I just think it's so cool that, that at a time when the recording industry and, and American pop music was like, you know, thriving and those guys, like they got so much traction and success with that. Um, I just love that that happened, you know, um, his drumming. And then, you know, he, you know, he kind of did like the jazz fusion thing too. He's on that like GRP live thing with Dave Grusin and Abe, Abe Sr., Abe LeBorl Sr. Um, yeah, love, love Carlos playing. I always had a great drum sound too, man. I, I wish I had a chance to see him. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, having good single stroke rolls the last sound also. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's see. Mountain Bushcrafters Alliance. <laughs> I'm a beginner at the age of 51. Any advice other than live with the drumsticks? Um, yeah, don't be too hard on yourself uh, if you're just starting out. Like, have fun. Uh, the, you know, you get out of it what you put into it, you know? Um, so when, when you say, like, oh, live with, live with the drumsticks, I mean, you can put them in your pocket and never use them, and that, you know, obviously that doesn't count. You know, if you're just starting out, you know, you got to just like, you know, I, I always say that, that the benefit of, of, being, of practicing drumming by yourself is that so you get to the point where it's like, okay, I don't have to worry about the drumming. Like, I, don't, I, I got that. I, I got it. And because when you get to the gig with other musicians, guess what? There's a ton more things you got to worry about that have nothing to do with drumming. You know, there's playing, playing the music, adjusting what you're playing for the venue. Can I hear myself? Like, can I hear the band okay, like with monitors? Like, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I want to have brain resources available to focus on that stuff, you know, focus on making music with people. And so I don't want to worry about the drumming. I want the drumming to just, oh, yeah, yeah, the drumming's happening. I, I can just kind of flip the switch, you know, within reason and just kind of do it. And use the rest of my resources to focus on the music making and the real life, you know, stuff that you have to deal with on the gig. Um, that's the that's the big benefit of like practicing a ton and getting like good technique. You know, some guys frown upon that. You know, guys that didn't have, you know, the guys that would dog things, the guys that would criticize things. You know, the groove guys always make fun of soloing. You know, the the that kind of thing. I never understood that, or I guess I do understand it. I just think it's funny. Um, but, you know, talking about guys criticizing technique, like that's the benefit of having good technique. That's the benefit of practicing your ass off is that it's just second nature. And why is it beneficial to be second nature? It's not just so you can say it. It's so that so when you're playing gigs, when you're playing with people, you can worry about like the form of the tune. You can worry about like, am I playing too loud? Am I playing loud enough to fit in with these musicians and make this music? That's the point. And that's the benefit to practicing a whole lot. Uh, let's see, uh, play along to your favorite songs. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I need to get some play alongs happening here. Uh, it's a very important point. Weffel developed the molar bounce thing after years of very fast physical playing with little bounce. That's true. Like, yeah, he powered out the strokes for years and years. My opinion, he does not focus enough on the physical foundation needed. Well, I mean, Weck didn't, like, I don't think he, you know, like, you could tell that Weck, you know, was a jazzer from early on like Buddy Rich and stuff he talks about. Like, I, I don't know how much time Weck spent, like, on the rock thing, you know. Uh, and so I don't know. I mean, I always thought that he kind of, you know, that's one of the differences between Vinny, actually, and Weck is, like, you know, Vinny graduated from the rock school. He knows rock. He has that rock, you know, the rock ball is the rock energy. Um, and, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that Weck doesn't. I mean, it's, it's not a matter of good, bad, better, or worse. You know, you just... Comparing this, you know, one of the best drummers in the world to this other guy that's also one of the best drummers in the world, and there's interesting differences. That's all. It's not, it's not a criticism. Um, it's just observing differences, you know. Um, let's see. Uh, any idea of the best way to develop push pull technique? Not really. I'm not very good at that. Um, let's see. Three hours a day is great start, dude. Keep it up. I mean, okay, these guys are talking about how much they practice. Uh, when. Da -da 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 -da. When playing buzz rolls, do you count uh, do you count different subdivisions? Uh, says Ben Gettysburg. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. My buzz rolls suck, man. But yeah, I mean it depends on the tempo, you know, uh, and, and like what what subdivision, you know, can you play at that tempo? Like if you're playing fast, then like you could just do like sixteenth notes and buzz. But if it's like a really slow thing, then you might have to do like sixteen note triplets or you know thirty second note triplets even, and just find that subdivision that kind of is still on the grid but allows you to play your buzz strokes. And kind of get that even buzz roll, you know, it's tricky. Um, so let's see, sounds great as usual. 
uh, but is it a touch quieter, says Bobby Vincent. Uh, oh, maybe. It's possible that my output is a touch quieter. Um, I mean, every time I do this, I'm surprised that everything works. I have a pretty primitive setup here, actually. Uh, let's see, let me see. I was just wondering if your arms pull up when playing traditional to placing those notes if you keep down marching band style. Um, I mean, you know, we talked about, this is Tom talking about left hand stuff. Again, like, you know, it depends on what you're playing. Like, if you're getting more volume, then yeah, the left hand comes up to get that volume. But if, if you're getting quieter, then it kind of stays down. Or if you want to just play everything quieter, but still maintain the accents and the quiet notes, just quieter, like everything quiet, but you still want that difference between the loud and the soft notes. That's actually fun to do. That's probably worth mentioning, you know? You know, so still being able to improvise between loud and soft and soft and loud, but like at a low volume, you know, um, that's important. I like doing that. You know, that's like years of coffee shop gigs. <laughs> you know, that, that's what that is. And, and you may have noticed like the stick came way back. Like that's what I was noticing. You get those rim shots, you know, you get just a very little bit of stick exposure. Right there. No, so you can still kind of get that rim shot sound, but at a quiet volume, which I think is interesting. It's fun playing quiet, but still having the freedom. You know, some guys, it's like they've got this stuff, but the quieter it is, the less of their stuff they can do. You know, like blowing and playing your your stuff like at quiet volumes. You know, that it's a thing. You know, it's not going to happen by itself. You know, um, in the early two thousands, man, I did so, I did a ton of coffee shop gigs, a lot of jazz gigs, and. Um, that was good practice for that stuff. Let's see. Uh, I was just wondering if your arm. Okay, yeah, we talked about that. Uh, is that an eight-inch recording custom yammy in the background? Yes, it is. Uh, it's hard to play. Sorry, I'm just catching up on uh, catching up on uh, comments here. Yeah, Danny Gottlam, Tusio, Steve Smith are epic. Yeah. Sing what you play. How would you sing triplets, fives, and sevens, says Sargon Yusip. Um, I mean, there's different, you know, different schools on singing that stuff. Uh, in elementary school, you know, we were told like triplet, triplet. And then when, actually when I got to Musicians Institute, they were like one ta-ta, two ta-ta for triplets. I mean, I'm just like da-ga-da-da-ga-da-da. You know, as long as what you're singing is accurate, it kind of doesn't matter, you know. Uh, for uh, triplets, fives, and sevens, I hardly sing sevens, but for fives, I mean, you know, it depends on where your accents are. I mean, it's just, I mean, again, it's just like, just any staccato, you know, <laughs> uh, syllable, it almost doesn't matter what it is. Um, but like fives, you know, like tekka tekka de tekka tekka de tekka tekka de tekka tekka de tekka 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 You know, those are like every fifth, sixteenth note as opposed to quintuplets, which is different. That's a whole other topic. Like accenting odd groups of an even subdivision is different from playing like quintuplets and septuplets. Like even five notes per quarter note, that's quintuplets. Playing groups of five, that's like I'm accenting groups of five, whatever, 16th notes. I'm accenting groups of five like triplets if you're Virgil Donati, you know? Like those are different things. Um, let's see, cool, cool, thanks, Steve. Love your drumming in your channel. Yeah, Frisco Pisco, man, no worries. What kind of drum heads are you using currently? How often do you change them? I don't change my heads as often as I should. Uh, I'm a Remo guy. These are all coded ambassadors with clear ambassadors on the bottom. Uh, power stroke on the bass drum. Pretty pretty uh, meat and potatoes, you know. Um, I try to tune the bottom head a little higher than the top for tom toms. Um, I like a nice low, like thunderous floor tom. Uh, and I like my toms to like really resonate, you know. Doom, boom, you know, I don't like like the staccato kind of thumpy sound. Uh, never understood Weckl traditional grip stick of of stick early days. 
Um, I don't know what that means. Have you heard Sting's Son, Seven Days Masterclass by Vinnie Kleiner? Uh, oh, yes, of course. Yeah, we've all, we've all heard Seven Days. Um, anyone that doesn't have Sting, Ten Summoners Tales should get it. It's like the, you know, the classic God Meter examples. Um, okay, yeah, we got to wrap it up here kind of soon. Um, let's see, after all the talk of Gruber's approach, can you talk about hitting into the drum and why that sounds better, especially in backbeats? Uh, I don't know if it sounds better. I mean, again, I try to stay away from, you know, approaching, when you compare things, I try to stay away from like, this is better than that. You know, it's just like strengths and weaknesses here, strengths and weaknesses here, you know. Um, and the strengths and weaknesses of playing into the drum, the strengths is like, you know, it's just that energy, assuming you're playing kind of loud, you know, there's, there's just, a, there's just a, a, an attitude and an energy that can come with that. Uh, and a volume, you know, like, it's, you know, playing match grip, you know, is, is just like, I don't know, it's, 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 it's inherently, I mean, I don't know, it's just a couple of different things, so, so many different levels, different muscles, it's just a different sound. And so it's important to me to be able to do both, actually, and that way I can just choose. So you don't have to be like, oh, I'm a match grip guy, I'm a traditional grip guy. It's like, okay, how about I'm the guy that can play the sound that I want to play at that time. That's the guy I want to be. Um, let's see, speaking of... Saying, uh, okay, we did that already, sorry. Are you saying shipping, singing during practicing? How often do you apply it? Not really. I should. Uh, Tom with another dollar. Thanks, Tom. Uh, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't sing anything other than, I mean, it depends. If I'm singing along to a song, you know, sure, I'll, I'll sing the song in my head um, while, I'm, while, I'm, uh, while I'm playing. And actually, sometimes while I'm improvising, you know, I'll hear music in my head that I'm kind of playing over. Um, so yes, I suppose in that regard I do, but never out loud. Um, let's see, Pilot Jeff says, any suggestions for someone who has a decent player years, intermediate and advanced, but hasn't played for a decade? <laughs> I want to re, I want to regain chips and uh, chips in an unfinished way rather than just hacking. Well, I mean, the answer to that is the same answer for a guy that's like, oh, I just started, you know, or I haven't, or I've been playing forever, like. You know, or the guy that earlier the stream, he was like, oh, I've been playing for 20 years, but I'm no good at this thing that I've never practiced, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, man. Like, you know, it depends on what you're talking about. Like, attack the thing, you know. Here's, here's the thing about practicing, you guys. A lot of people, they practice in what I call, like, checklist style. You know, like Jazz Independence, for example. Like, they'll get the Jim Chapin book or the Ted Reed book, and it's like, okay, I can now play it. Check. I don't have to work on it anymore. Like, no. If your goal is to make music, then like it never ends. You can practice it your whole life and you'll get better. Like, you know, the masters still, they work on stuff, they, they still get better at it, you know? It, it really is, it's never, you know, it, you're never done. You can always improve and, and at this point, like it's no secret. Like there is no secret, you know? Practice slow, practice the right stuff the right amount. That's it. Like we need to put that on a T-shirt and sell it. Practice the right stuff, the right amount. You can practice the wrong stuff for the for for way long, and you're just you're reinforcing the wrong stuff. You got to practice the right stuff. You got to practice the right amount. Um, and I guess you got to practice it the right way. And the right way is slow, and then speed it up until it sucks, and then slow it down again. And if you continue to do that, the speed at which it sucks will move. It'll move. Like, oh, I can only do it like a medium tempo, and then it starts to suck. Well, guess what? Slow it down. Stay here. Practice, practice, practice. And then when you speed up, the sucky tempo, you kind of pushed it. Like, that's the process. Rinse and repeat. Okay? Uh, so, let's see. Uh, after all the talk of Gruber's approach, yeah, we just did that. Let's see. Vinny is the man. I agree. Um, Steve Holmes is the man. Oh, thank you very much. One D. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what was the site you saw? Shed some light available. What's on that? Um, man, shed some light is a video uh, that I made um, and sold on the internet um, in the '90s. Uh, a VHS tape that I sold on my website. It was like, to my knowledge, it's the first internet-specific like drum instructional video that was for sale only on the internet. It was called Shed Some Light. It was film professional with some friends of mine that were in the TV industry. Uh, it was it was a ton of fun. A friend of mine had a, a, a recording studio, and we recorded it there. And and my friend edited it and and whatever. And then someone at Hal Leonard saw it, and I forget his name. I feel really bad because he did me a huge favor. And he was like, "Hey man, can I show this to some people here?" 
And I was like, sure. And then Hal Leonard got in touch with me and they said, oh, we want to put this out on DVD. And so they did. And so Shed Some Light is available on DVD. I think you can actually like, you know, it's on Amazon and stuff. Um, but the question is what's on there? It's, it's similar to like the stuff you see me do. Like I play like different licks and stuff and I break them down. I talk about magic modulation. I talk about playing four, four and six, eight. Uh, talk about playing to a click. We talk about ghost notes. Um, but man, like, I mean, I, I don't, I certainly don't want to discourage you from buying it, but like, if you just watch all the stuff on my YouTube channel, it's like, you know, you're almost better off. Um, but if you just want to support me and, and all of a sudden how Leonard will be like, Steve, why is everybody buying your DVD? Then by all means, go buy it. It's called Shed Some Light. Um, let's see. So the words, right, implies you need a teacher. So I think you need to visit a teacher that maybe didn't teach you. Steve, tell Jeff Miley. Tom Freely says hello. You tell him. You tell him, Tom. <laughs> Get in touch with Jeff and reach out. But no, I'll, I'll, I'll let Jeff know. Jeff Miley is an amazing guitarist, you guys. I love Jeff. Um, man, there's like 60 people right now. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'd like to play some more, but I need to go check on my dog. My dog's inside, and I'm, and I'm flying solo today. So we need to go check on our dog, right? So you animal advocates can understand that. So I'm actually going to go check on my dog. And Rocking my Bo Burnham inside t-shirt today. I'm a big fan of that guy's, that guy's stuff. That Netflix special inside, oh man, so good. As someone that creates content, <laughs> As someone that creates content, I can appreciate the work that goes into something like that, man. That guy's amazing. Um, anyways, for those of us that are joining during the break, my name is Steve Holmes. We're streaming live from the drum room. We did a bunch of drumming. We did a bunch of talking. And uh, we had to take a break and feed some animals. And now we're back because I wanted to do a little more drumming, actually. Uh, let's, uh, let's see how the comments are doing. Uh, let's see, Tush, Steve, Jeff Miley. Oh, yeah, we talked about Jeff Miley, the amazing guitar player. You speak about not just being a phenom, but being someone that gets hired for gigs. There's a difference. Uh, that's true. <laughs> I mean, I am neither one of those. <laughs> I am not a phenom, nor am I someone that gets hired for gigs. Uh, in the context of getting hired for gigs, I mean, like, obviously that changes as time goes on and, and the importance of live music, et cetera. Uh, but I would like to think that, that no matter where you live, there's got to be some kind of scene nearby. Um, and if you want to be the guy that gets gigs, then, then there's a couple of things that I would recommend. Like, you have to be visible. You have to be visible. You've got to be at gigs, whether you're playing them or not. So there's like a, a hanging out in real life kind of thing. I mean, you know, with the advent of the internet and YouTube and stuff, like th there is that, right? Like, having impressive content on the internet will help. Um, but there's just no substitute for just being out and gigging and being seen and gigging um, and networking with real people uh, that are doing the gigging <laughs> uh, or, you know, see someone play, you know, live. They might be more inclined to recommend, you know, you, um, regardless of the music um, and certainly regardless of how good your drumming is. It's not, it, I mean, if you want to be seen playing live music and you want to get recommended for playing live music, then you have to play live music well, which is different from, from just good drumming. <laughs> you know, you have to know about music, you have to understand the intention of music, and you have to, you know, play, play music. I mean, you get, I mean, knowing different styles and stuff, like, oh, I can play bossa, I can play big band, blah, blah, blah. Like, again, like what I was talking about before, like, okay, well, now we're in a coffee shop. And so the equipment that I pick has to fit that gig. You know, uh, the volume that I play has to work with the volume that everyone else is playing so that people in the audience get a good, you know, uh, a good thing, you know, a good dose of live music, you know. Uh, there's so much involved in that that doesn't have anything to do with, with flashy drumming. Uh, and I think that's interesting, and I think it's very challenging. And I certainly have a hell of a lot of respect for anyone uh, that can do that. Um, and so you want to be the guy that can, or the girl that can, or the person that can, you know, insert, insert, you know, uh, proper pronoun here. Um, but, you know, you want to be the guy that, like, comes to mind. Like, there's people here in L.A., like, there's a guy here in L.A. named Joel Taylor, 
who just gigs all the, like he is just he works his ass off and if you're the guy that's known for that because you're just gigging all over town for years and years then then literally you want people to associate you with playing live oh playing live oh it's probably that guy you know you know joe smith that i see all the time everywhere you know he's on big band gigs he's on rock he's on the top 40 gigs like he's everywhere you know so you want to be the guy that's like doing it successfully everywhere so that you come to mind first as a result of being seen in real life how's that um what what sticks do you use and do you change them often it says modern architecture uh, I love Vader 5Bs, and I am not a Vader artist. I've come close, <laughs> uh, and it's partially my fault for not bugging those guys enough, but I had a little traction for, for a minute with a guy named Chad, uh, who's, uh, you know, he's busy dealing with people that are touring stadiums and stuff. He doesn't want to bother with me. Uh, but I love Vader. Vader 5B um, have always felt like home uh, to me, and that may change at one point, you know. Um, I don't experiment very often with different brands, but it's possible that it, you know the next time I do, I might be like, oh man, these these Vic first sticks are amazing. I want to use them from now on. But right now, uh, Vader 5B is the stick of choice. Uh, Got to check that dog. That's true. We checked on uh, our dog Benny. Benny's fine. He's not happy that I left again, but at least he's fed and he went outside. Hey, Steve, what kind of dog is he or she? I have a Labradoodle. Um, I love, uh, yeah, I love my dog, Benny. He's great. Let's see. Let's see, can you please talk about how to use the click other than obvious, like say every third eight, thank you, says Andy McPherson. Um, well, you know, Andy, I didn't really spend a lot of time turning on a click and then having it be like, well, now that's the eighth note that's on the E and the uh. <laughs> you know, like I've always wanted to spend more time doing that. But you know what I did do, which was really uh, beneficial, was I would program a click to start and stop. And by stop, I mean like stop for like a bar <laughs> or two bars. You know, I would do like a four bar loop and I would have a quarter note for two bars and then I would have silence for two bars. And that really kicked my ass and that was really very helpful. And that's actually something I talk about on that old DVD we were discussing before the break, uh, Shed Some Light. I talk about that and I actually demonstrate that on there a little bit. Um, which in hindsight, I'm kind of happy that I did because a lot of guys don't talk about that. And to give credit where credit is due, that, that concept was, was brought to my attention by um, a fantastic teacher named Fred Dinkins, uh, who was a teacher at Musicians Institute, and he's an LA guy. Uh, that, was, that was Fred's thing. Like he, he would turn on the click and, and have it go on and off and, and just rock solid time, great feeling time. And so that's super beneficial. Uh, and maybe you know one day I'll, I'll you know I'll, w when I upgrade my setup here you know we'll get some play alongs and some clicks and some programming stuff to play along with because it's pretty silly that all I do is just play here by myself to be honest um, and it's not because I can't or because I don't want to play with tracks I just don't have the setup here to to have logic like play <laughs> while I'm streaming because I don't want this laptop to have to do anything else because I'm lucky it can do what it does so uh, there's that but yes. Proxying a click, like, and you don't have to do two bars with two bars without. I mean, that's a long time. I would start, like, basically I would do, like, I would maybe, you know, uh, I would just do one bar of just, like, have the click on, like, counts one and two and nothing on counts three and four, you know. Uh, or just have, have it give you the count of one, you know. Uh, or just have it give you, like, one and three. You know, basically, like, kind of give you pillars to work in between instead of giving you every, everything. You know, and you kind of remove pillars the more comfortable you are. Like, well, I only need a pillar on one, you know. Uh, and start simple and do it slow. That was the other thing. That was the other thing that Fred, Fred got me doing. And I mean like 60, 60 BPM, 50 BPM, you know. Like start slow uh, and play simple. And make sure you're with the click and... If I was successful by staying with the click during those puppets of silence, then I would take, then it's like, okay, I take a chance, play a fill. And sure enough, I'd be like, zap, do, stega, doom, psh, king, king, king. And I'd be like, oh man, like I'm not with it. And so I knew then to stop taking chances and go back to simple playing. You know, so it's almost like a game. You know, it's like operation or something. Like when you hit the, you know, eh, like you, you, you got to start over. <laughs> Keep, you know, you, you killed the guy. Um, so, as you succeed, you take more chances and you can get busier. 
And the cool thing about playing like at slow tempos is that you can like subdivide. You know, if you're playing at 50, then double time is 100, and you can play your stuff, you know, your 100 BPM stuff at w while the click is doing 50, you know, et cetera. You know, if you're playing 60, then double time is 120. It's like 80% of 80s pop music is like 120, you know? Um, and so that's a good tempo to like blow your stuff. And so it seems like you're playing super fast while the click is doing 60, but really you're just playing like at 120 in your head. That's the nature of double time, right? So that's how I uh, practiced a click a long time ago. I had uh, had the click go on and off and just stayed with it, basically. Um, let's see. The faithful, we're still here. Yeah, I appreciate you guys hanging out while I went to take care of my dogs. Uh, how far can you take playing uh, at a time variation three against four? Three groups of four sixteenths and four groups of triplets. Oh, I see. Uh, I haven't spent too much time on that. It seems I'm speeding up and slowing down tempo. Is there a limit to this? I don't know. I, 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 I haven't spent too much time with that stuff, and so I can't say. I feel like we've done a lot of talking, though, and I should do some playing because people are going to get bored. Uh, so I actually am going to do some playing before we continue on with these comments because people that have just come in, they're like, this guy needs to shut up and play. And um, we've got my 50 folks here now, so let's do some playing, okay, and then I'll come back and answer some more questions. All right, my name's Steve Holmes. We're streaming from Los Angeles. Thanks for hanging out.
That was funny. <laughs> I totally blew that single stroke thing I was going for. And I was like, dude, you got to do the thing you were saying, like, slow it down. You know, like practice it slow and do it until you can and then go back if you screw it up. Like I went through the process with that, you know, like dig it a 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 do. You know, like it's the kind of thing that I'd never play on a gig, but I don't know, you hear the thing in your head, you go for it, you try to do it, and like you stumble and it's like, okay, stop, record scratch. It's like you gotta go back and go through the process, you know. Uh, my name's Steve Holmes. Thanks for hanging out. Anyone interested in supporting the channel, there's a super sticker like the smiley face, the dollar sign. If anyone makes uh, wants to make a contribution, that would be awesome. We're trying to get some new cameras and stuff in here, um, and so that would be amazing. Um, so, returning to the comments, what overhead mics are you using? Actually, the the mics that I have here are pretty. They're pretty cheap, actually. I got a. Uh, I don't even know if it's available anymore. It's called the AKG Groove Pack. Um, and that was the overheads and the toms and the kick. And then I bought some extra ones for like the snare and the hat and stuff. SM57 on the snare. Just some cheap like condenser on the, on the hat. Um, yeah, so, so that's what I got. Uh, I'm a big believer in like, you know, the mics are important. Obviously all the gear is important and the better the gear, the better the the better the fidelity of the sound but like man even with cheap mics like all those youtube videos you know i have with the with with my mics like you know the the drum sound you can get nowadays with logic is is pretty good if you have a good source uh, if you have decent mics even cheap mics uh, let's see just bombed my jazz audition i didn't get into the ensemble probably the worst audition i've ever had really bummed says chris reyes uh at 120 it's like 20 minutes ago uh, Chris, man, the the uh, the the good thing about failures is like learn, learn, learn. You know, um, every single successful person has failure stories. Every single person, and so you already have that in common <laughs> with them. You know, you're already on the road to success by kind of tripping and falling. You know, um, just make sure you learn. You know, you learn from that failure. Find out what it was that, you know, like I mentioned before, like strengths and weaknesses, like what were the weaknesses that, that, you know, prevented them, you know, from picking you and going with someone else. Maybe find out, you know, I would encourage you to check out the person they did go with. Maybe talk to that person. You know, there's a huge opportunity there, right? So you know for sure that that person was chosen by, I mean, assuming that, that it was the right choice. I mean, it's possible the person judging had no idea what they were doing, but point being it's at least worth checking them out and trying to see like hey what's this person doing you know that that got them chosen you know and chances are it's the thing that I mentioned before which is just like you know knowing the music get you know getting into the music you know and making music you know coming from that standpoint you know thinking about the tune and having the tune sound the best that it can sound you know it's not a it's not the kind of thing drummers talk about a lot. You know, we're all about drumming, and I'm no exception. I love talking about drumming and geeking out. But when it comes to playing band with bands and music, like I always say the same thing, because I love music. You know, I, I would imagine you do too. I would imagine anyone that wants to make music loves music. You know, um, and there's a reason why I love music. Uh, you know, because you know you love what the music says and the feeling you get when you hear the music. You want other people to get that feeling too, and so it's on you to 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 make that happen. None of that has anything to do with like drumming really like the drumming has to ha be happening like I don't want to act like oh it's got nothing to do with drumming like obviously the drumming point is like the drumming needs to be together and then you talk then you worry about making music especially in the contents of a jazz um, jazz ensemble uh, let's see Tom oh man folks are uh, folks are donating this is great let's see Tom with another five bucks can you show us maybe four or three even two Go to licks that you use for your fills where you set up an accent or a push as we call it here in Nashville. Oh, and the end of four. Um, man, playing an accent on the end of four. I mean, the simplest one. Man. <laughs> this is actually a great question. I, and I'm feeling like the pressure like on the spot, you know, like, I mean, what I would do that, I mean, honestly, what I would do, Tom, and, and I'll try this and I'll maybe like, I'll probably embarrass myself, but I would just, I would just, you know, program a vamp or something that has a hit on the end of four, like a four bar phrase, right? And on the fourth bar, it plays the end of four. 
you know and I would just blow over that that's what I would do um, and and then I would try to remember like oh that that was kind of cool you know you know coming up with fills that that set up figures you know it's tempting to to try to play something cool and something fancy that may technically fit you know in terms of like you know the drumming standpoint like you know oh you know I'm playing 16 note triplets and I play you know on the count of four I'm playing three triplets before I play the end of four and stuff but it's like you know the, the the point of setting up the figure is is to set it up you know there's probably no substitute for like a you know a two note thing you know one two two but that's bam you know like it's a simple a simple kind of thing you know I would make sure that that those kind of simple fills are happening and that I can do them like second nature unconsciously like those simple setups before I get into something more fancy um, and the fancy ones would probably be variations of the simple ones they would probably just be busier versions like more notes but the accents would probably still be the same um, I wish I could like turn on a, a thing and just like oh have it be on you know in there for you know um, so that that's what I got also I would recommend not for that kind of thing for a fill that I mean like that fill has a responsibility like it's setting up a figure like on the, the end of four right um, I would recommend not playing a subdivision that's like tons faster than what the tune is doing like if the tune is like an eighth note thing you know if, if the eighth notes are the driving force of the tune you know the groove subdivision then I would probably my first instinct would be to stick with that as my subdivision for the fill I wouldn't like double it with 16th notes um, at first I would maybe experiment with like eighth note fills um, because at that point you're kind of like you're staying on the groove of you know, that pulse of the tune you know as opposed to like you know playing something fast kind of out of nowhere uh, this brings up the, a term I like to use a lot which is uh, listenability like how listenable is something you know uh, playing a fill that sets up a figure as opposed to like just a fill that's on its own going from like a verse to a chorus right and you play like a big fill that goes into the chorus then there's kind of more room in that regard uh, but if, if you're playing a fill that, that comes out on a band hit like on the end of four there's more responsibility there and sometimes you know you, you don't want to play something that technically works but like just as a listener like no drumming no 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 drum geekery just listening be like hmm did that interrupt the flow you know you know I would go back and listen to it I know this is all like probably disappointing because you want some cool like fusiony <laughs> fusiony thing um, you know as I get older I, I find myself more and more impressed and intrigued by like simple pop music like perfect example is like the Eagles new kid in town I hated that song when I was young I was like this is this song is dumb now I love that song like there's days and days I can't get that song out of my head that song is so incredibly simple um, and it was a huge hit so that song like gelled with people that song like affected people like there's no argument there like the, you can't argue with that it's not about like oh this song sucks no 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 no. that song reached a ton of people it's a su su successful song right and so I would go back and like listen to like what what was going on there you know it's Don Henley not the best drummer in the world but man his drumming is on all those all those all those hits you know and so there's some there's some cool stuff there you know to, to go back and, and check out anyway those are my thoughts on that um, let's see have you tried a Johnny Rob 5B? I haven't. <clears throat> overhead mics are using. We talked about overhead mics while Steve's losing his voice. Man, folks are coming in with the donations. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. 1DK, 1DK, 1DK with 15 bucks, man. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Digital Perspective with the $20 donation. Really appreciate Digital Perspectives. I feel like you've donated before. Uh, man, and Jerome Nichols with the five bucks. Man, Jerome, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. This is awesome. We're going to have a new camera and a camera switcher here in no time. Uh, let's see what else we got. What's the setup you're using for broadcast in terms of switching between speech mic versus drum mics? Uh, I, I don't have a, I mean, I have, <clears throat> I can show you what I have actually. I've got this, uh, I mean, this talkie mic. It's called a lavalier mic, obviously, and that's going into a focus right. Sapphire Pro 40. Um, man, I don't want to move this laptop, but the laptop's literally sitting on it. It's a Sapphire Pro 40, uh, which is my recording unit. All the drum mics are going into the Sapphire Pro 40. The talking mic's going into the Sapphire Pro 40. The Sapphire is going into my laptop, uh, Firewire out to Thunderbolt in, uh, which is really old. 
um, those connections are old, but that, that's what it's doing. And then I have logic running right now. Um, and I'm using real time, like all the like compressors and EQ and stuff in, in logic. Getting that to work in real time for streaming purposes took quite a while. I had to download this uh, audio plugin program called, um, I think it's called the Black Hole. I can't tell you what it's called. I'm going to click on things and we're going to take a chance here that Steve's not going to break things. Um, Black Hole. Yeah, it's called the Black Hole uh, audio plugin for Mac. And what that does is it allows you to create a new audio output that your computer recognizes, but that single output is made out of several inputs, like logic. <laughs> that was the key, is setting my logic uh, to, to output to like the black hole plugin. Um, and then my streaming program is OBS, which is a free program. And then OBS is receiving my audio source as the black hole uh, plugin. And so that's how that works. And so I just turn off my mic uh, when I'm drumming. And the drum mics are always on, like they're on right now. Uh, so that, that's my setup. I need to upgrade it though. Um, I need more cameras and a camera switch and a better laptop. But that's the gist of it. Playing better than usual, says Bobby Vincent. Thanks, we'll take the win, Bobby. Um, let's see, hey Steve, what's the setup that you're using for, okay, we just talked about that. So you'd rather play than talk. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. Very cool, Steve, got quite a tight and hip sound for the Yamaha, F yes, this is Yamaha Phoenix, Yamaha PHX. Love these drums. You saw me like tune down my snare a little bit though. Like it was, it was cranked too much. Uh, it didn't feel good. Um, let's see. Awesome. Like that hi-hat opening, closing chick. Good topic to cover. Yes, uh, we can do that. Single, triple, slice. Not always doubles. Yeah, I was working on the singles thing, trying to work that out. Nice for all these digital perspectives. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. When I close a national radio syndication in 2022, I want to come find you, Miley and crew, for some real November international drum love things. Yeah, man. Yeah, let's hang out. Or do like a Zoom lesson or something. Let's do it. You guys want lessons? Uh, Steve Holmes at gmail.com. We can do some Zoom lessons. Uh, see, you have a Dave Wickle snare on the shelf. How good is that snare to play on? Uh, it's a great snare. I just don't, I don't like how it sounds in this particular room. Uh, but it's a great snare. Uh, to add to your point, one of the things that you had always helped me with bands and songs, don't just learn the song, learn the changes. Yes, as digital perspectives. Especially if you're playing jazz, man. That's still one of my weaknesses. Um, because I tend to do like, because you know, as drummers, we don't have to play, you know, we don't have to worry about chord changes necessarily, but you do have to worry about the form of the tune. And I tend to zone out if I'm like, okay, is this like groups of four bars, groups of, you know, eight bars? Then, then you know, you kind of don't have to listen that much. You just like, you know, just keep track of four bar groupings. But that's bad. Like, you gotta, you gotta be able to recognize the changes of the tune while the guy's soloing. You gotta know when we're coming back to the top of the, of the, of the form. Um, and support the soloist in that regard. It's all very important. And if there's an odd number of bars in the form, then then that can be really tricky. You know, I find the best thing to do there is just you know memorize what the chord changes sound like, and hopefully the chord changes are such that they kind of spell out, you know, where the form is. Like a blues chord progression spells out, you know, okay, here we are. We're coming. We're doing the turnaround back to the top. You know, um, there's a tune. Uh, an old fusion tune called, oh man, what is the tune that Tony Williams did with uh, on Lifetime? Proto Cosmos. Uh, the changes to Proto Cosmos really do a good job of spelling out the form. I always found that helpful. Proto Cosmos is a great tune to learn. Tricky tune in three. Uh, and there's some figures there that are actually bars of two. If you listen to Proto Cosmos and don't look at the chart, like it's very deceptive. It's like, bet, bad at, you know, drum fill, drum fill. Bet bad at, but it's like the 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 downbeat is actually like bet bad at, <laughs> you know it's not bet bad at, it's bet bad at one. It's crazy. I was surprised when I saw that, and so that that helped uh, to practice that tune. Uh, the the Phoenix has come with what you see here, diecast hoops. I think so. I haven't changed the hoops. They come with everything you see here. Um, Sorry, I don't have that information. I can tell you what the shell's made out of, though. So I'm being a good Yamaha drum advocate. Maple Birch Jatopa. That's the shell. Love these drums. They're Honestly, the PHX drums, acoustically, sonically, they're just a little bit loud than most drums. You know, they sound louder. They sound like they're going through a preamp. It's, it's nuts. Uh, Vinny, the thought, <laughs> thought is the enemy of flow. Yeah, there's an argument to be made there for sure. Uh, probably a bit later. Do you recommend the bottom of the top? Do you recommend a bottom 
and the top mic for snare. I have no experience messing with mixing a snare drum that has both top and bottom mic, so I can't say. A lot of folks do it though, so it must work for them. If anyone hasn't checked it out, Vinny, it's a great podcast, Breakfast with Vinny. Yes, Vinny does a podcast um, called Breakfast with Vinny, which is, um, it's entertaining if you're a fan of Vinny. Uh, Vinny likes to talk about a lot of stuff um, besides drumming <laughs> these days. Uh, and there's lots of audio clips of, of, of clinics and stuff of Vinny in the past, and so obviously he's done his share of talking about drumming. I mean, he never did any instructional videos or anything, which is kind of a bummer. And, you know, some folks may or may not know, he's just, he's just not a fan of being filmed, um, which I think made sense, you know, but now in this age of like, you know, you know, Vinny's on Twitter and, and, and he talks about YouTube and stuff. And so, so it's like the cat's out of the bag. Like watching videos is a good thing. Like if you're a drummer, you want to see your favorite drummer do things. And yes, there is, uh, there is, benefit to mystery but if your goal is to learn there's no substitute for like watching the guy do the thing you know um and all these interviews with Vinny, like he just did one yesterday with john de christopher on facebook which was super cool super entertaining uh Vinny seems like a very funny guy i've i've never i mean i've met him like casually at gigs but i'm i don't know him um i would love to interview the guy and actually kind of you know approached someone that that knows him blah 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 and and, and I kind of I didn't do it because I didn't like the circumstances that were um that were outlined to me and that you know he, he was wanting to in, do an interview with me but he didn't want it like recorded which which it is what it is but here's the thing like Vinny is so amazing like in the old excuse me in the old modern drummer magazines like they had a a, a column called on the record you know uh and they would have drummers that played on records listen back to those records and just talk about them and i think that there's i think there would be an amazing interview with vinny and i think i'm the guy to do it <laughs> to be honest like there's a bunch of records i want to put on uh with vinny and just be like okay john patitucci spaceships like i just want to put on and be like dude start talking <laughs> like what what is going on here like what do you remember from this session what what the heck is like uh you know and and i have low expectations actually i bet he would just be like you know i'm just playing the music like he wouldn't he wouldn't probably have a lot of specific things to say and i understand how that works i just think many fans would still get a kick out of hearing him talk about specific tracks you know because there's so many to choose from um and i've listened to so much of his playing um and like turning off the busyness and playing simple for the sake of music and then turning it back on i'd really like to pick his brain on that topic um i don't know if you guys have seen this really good example of this uh there's a, an old, like in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, the, the BET put out a Shaka Khan DVD. BET, the Black Entertainment Television. They put out a DVD. It was Shaka Khan singing with a band. And in the band, it was Vinny playing drums. And we bought the DVD as soon as it came out, you know, all those Vinny fans. And Vinny plays ama amazing on there. He plays beautiful on there. But he's not terribly busy, right? He's playing the music. He's playing for the music. Uh, and it's great. Like, it, it's a great DVD. Um, then, like, cut to, like, years later... Years later, there was some footage released of that TV session where they recorded the DVD of them, like, sound checking, literally sound checking. And Vinny is blowing all kinds of stuff. Blowing, blowing, blowing. Chop, chop, chops. Busy, busy, busy. And it's amazing. It's, like, amazing, incredible footage for Vinny fans. And I remember seeing this and being like, oh, my God, this stuff is amazing, you know? But the point is, like, the contrast between, like, okay, I'm just messing around, I'm doing a sound check, we're getting drum sounds, and I'm blowing all kinds of cool stuff. And there's other musicians there that are kind of playing with him, and he's playing with super busy. Basically, it's like a fusion gig. It's nuts. Uh, but then it's like when the cameras roll, and it's time to like play this thing with Shaka Khan, like, he doesn't play like that. You know, he plays simple, simpler. He plays what the music calls for, and I would love to talk about that with him. Uh, let's see. Uh, meets me. Some guys don't know what their casts are. Yeah, you know what? Honestly, John... Bonani, Bonani. I'm not a big gearhead. Like some guys don't know what diecasts are. It's true. Like it, I, I, I'm, I'm just like some guys are just into gear. I'm not into gear for the sake of gear. I'm into gear about the same as I'm into cars. Like I want it to look neat and I want it to sound good. Like for drums, as a, like a car, I want it to look good and drive good. Like for 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 drums, like I want it to look look good. You know, in my opinion, and I want it to sound good. You know, I'm not like, oh, the 1970s Rogers diecast hoop versus the Tama from the 1983 China factory hoops. Like, I'm not that guy. I know there's lots of those guys out there. They've got all kinds of Facebook groups and stuff. And, 
And I think that's super cool to be into that stuff on that level. Uh, Lord knows that I geek out about all kinds of other stuff. Um, but drum gear is not uh, one of those things. Uh, Tim Wilson, Vinny on Secrets with Alan Holdsworth. Yes, let's put on City Nights, you guys. Let's get Vinny in a room and put on City Nights and be like, dude, start talking. Like, what, what's happening here? You know, what do you remember from this session? You know, I heard that that was just like, you know, him and uh, Jimmy Johnson on bass and, you know, they, like Alan came back and recorded over that later and like they just, they just you know, blew through that, you know, um, blew through that stuff. Uh, there's some amazing drumming on there and, and it's worth discussing. And uh, I would love to have a chance to do that with Vinny. Uh, so yeah, there's that. So I think we've reached the end of the comments. We've gone a really long time today. We've gone like two hours. Really appreciate all the donations. Thank you so much. Uh, if anyone else wants to donate, um, we'll give it a couple minutes. If you want to support the channel, hit that super button, hit the little dollar sign. Boom. Make a donation. The next thing that I'm saving up for, I want to get a camera switch, a Blackmagic camera switch. Uh, it's like you plug a bunch of cameras into it and then you can choose like what camera. Because I have, I have another, I've got several cameras. I just can't have them all on at the same time because there's, you know, like using the USB output from a camera is crap. You've got to use like HDMI. And so we just gotta we just gotta upgrade stuff uh, and get it happening. Uh, so that's what the donations will go towards. Uh, really appreciate you guys hanging out. My name is Steve Holmes. We're streaming from Los Angeles. Um, we'll continue to do these as long as my arms allow. We're still having some tendon issues in the elbows, um, and we took several months off. I took several months off uh, and gave them a break and let them heal up. Uh, but they're better now. But they're still they're not a hundred percent better. So I guess there's an argument to be made that I shouldn't be drumming at all. Um, I guess we'll see. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Borb, uh, Borba Simmel's glad, glad you're back behind the key. Yeah, man. Thank you. How would you approach a jazz waltz? Uh, that's too meaty of a topic. Uh, can you show us a shuffle? Says Jerome Nichols. Jerome, you made a donation. And so, yes, uh, I will show you a shuffle. There's different kinds of shuffles, uh, like the traditional four on the floor shuffle. Um, first of all, before I de like my shuffles are not amazing, you know. Step one is like find some good, um, find some good reference for this stuff, and I'll tell you what is amazing reference for shuffles. Ready, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Chris Layton on drums, man, man, shuffle king. I took a lesson with Tom Breckline years and years ago. I took one lesson with him because Tom. Uh, got you know he's got his shuffle stripes on his shoulders because he played with Robin Ford in the Blue Line in the 90s. Robin Ford, amazing guitar player. It's another great reference for shuffles. You know like traditional shuffle. You know four on the floor. Like obviously it's got a swing. You know over top of triplets. Um, you know the left hand. Like in terms of what I'm thinking before I even start playing, it's like I want the I want the the swung eighth notes on the snare. Did dit did dit did dit. I want to play the backbeat two and four. Did dit did dot did dit did dot. And the you know the ride cymbals playing you know all the eighth notes too kind of at the same time with the hands I'm doing four on the floor like that's the academic thing you know there's like you want it to be like this kind of sloppy you know like sometimes it helps me to to have like an artistic reference in in the way that like a painter would have a reference or a movie director would have a reference of like well you know what's the inspiration for this and I picture like I picture like a big guy like behind like serving up like sloppy potatoes at, at like a cafeteria line or something like just like just big sloppy not clean not precise which is where my weakness will be like my shuffle will be clean and precise and that's bad so check out Chris Layton but just because you're asking and because you made a donation we'll play some shuffles and then we'll just start blowing over shuffles for a little bit. Um, it's different kind of shuffles, half type shuffle, the, like the blue shuffle. Um, yeah, whatever, we'll just shuffle it up. Um, but that'll be it. Um, I'll check out the Alexander Technique for your arms. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for hanging out. This was so much fun. Uh, I'll play some shuffles, but then we gotta cut it. I'm gonna go back and make sure my dog doesn't eat, eat my place. <laughs>
All right, so we started with kind of like the traditional shuffle, four on the floor, and um, I slowed it down, kind of showed you what I was doing. It turns out I was playing the jazz pattern on my ride. I was not playing all of the eighth notes. I was saying like da 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 da. Um, just trying to get sloppy, you know, four on the floor, different tempos, and then we took away the four on the floor and started messing around with like variations, boons, that boon, that boons, but that boons, but that boon. You know, I like doing the. Uh, you know, what's cool is when you put the bass drum under the backbeat. You know, boom, ba ba. You know, so you get the bass drum and the snare drum at the same time on the backbeat. Like, do that on purpose, like at key points, and it like gives it a little bit of a oomph. You know, um, and then we went to the hi hat, and you know, demonstrated the ghost note. You know, the the middle triplet ghost note for regular time and halftime shuffles. And then if there's enough time, like you can diddle that ghost note. Ba -ba -da -da, uh, I, can't, I can't even say it. Ba -ba -da -da -ba -ba, you know, that kind of thing. That's another like you know whack. Uh, Vinny e. Novak thing you know those guys do that a lot it sounds kind of cool but don't you know you want to do with all this stuff on purpose you don't want to do it because it's like uh, you know second nature you know like automatic pilot like what's best for the tune like period the end okay so that's sh that's shuffle stuff I hope that was helpful um, let's see what else sloshy hi-hat yes tell about the slosh let's see try, uh, let's see sloshy foot yes uh, what are your thoughts on Marcus Gilmore was tipped off about him recently, my drum teacher. Uh, I've checked out a bunch of Marcus's stuff, and, and I mean, he's a great jazz drummer. You know, he's one of these guys that you know. There's there's a group of guys out there, a bunch of guys, these these kind of East Coast schooled jazz guys like Ari Honig and and and, and these kind of guys that that their output is like it's very contained, like volume wise. You know, they're kind of it's like this kind of clackety staccato you know, low volume thing that that I think is cool. Uh, I mean, there's clips of like Marcus, like with Chick Corea, like blowing over Humpty Dumpty. Like I can't do that stuff. Marcus is amazing for being able to do that. Um, and it's funny, I was thinking about this recently when talking about drummers. It's interesting, it's like, it's like I, he has superpowers, I just don't like what he does with his superpowers, <laughs> you know? Where it's like, yes, he's an amazing painter, I'm just, I'm, I just don't like the, these paintings, but, but, but he's an amazing artist, you know? It's like, it's that kind of thing. Um, but man, I would, I mean, with his experience and stuff, I would love to, like, pick that guy's brain. Or just have him come and watch me suck and be like, dude, you know, talk about playing over the form and, and stuff that's helped him in that regard. Because he's obviously, you know, got that stuff mastered. Um, so yeah, I'll shut up before I make a fool out of myself anymore talking about Marcus. Uh, always so great when you perform, teach. Thank you, thank you. Chuck on Soundcheck is one of my favorite videos. Yes, it's amazing. Great playing, thank you very much. Two servings of Sloppy Joe Shuffle. <laughs> Let's see, how about the hi-hat foot in the middle trip but before the backbeat, the moneymaker shuffle, that's funny. I think actually that was, I think Breckline actually mentioned that to me in my lesson with him. And I like, I tried it, and I totally couldn't do it. Like I haven't worked on that at all, but I have heard of that actually. That's super cool because it comes right before the backbeat. Um, okay, we're gonna call it. It's been like two and a half hours. I really need to go inside. Um, thanks for hanging out, you guys. This was super fun. My name is Steve Holmes. We're streaming live from Los Angeles in the drum room. Uh, we plan on continuing to do these until we can't anymore. Uh, that's it. If you haven't checked out my channel, I would suggest you do that. I've got a lot of uh, instructional videos on my YouTube channel. Um, they're worth checking out if folks are not familiar with them. Uh, there's a bunch of videos of me playing like, you know, bullshit solos and stuff. You know, don't worry about that stuff. Watch the instructional video. There's some good topics on there and you can come back and we can chat about it. Also, I'm available for lessons if anyone wants to set up a Zoom thing. I may not respond right away, but just keep bugging me. SteveHolmes at gmail.com. Um, all right, that's it. Thanks a lot, folks. See you next time.